If you want to help Myth Vision Podcast grow, you can join our Patreon. There are different tiers as well as help out with PayPal. Thank you so much. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and comment. My name is Derek Lambert, and I'm going to be talking about my conversion as a young man into Christianity. Pretty much everything that surrounds what we call the canon, the Bible, Christianity. Um, and talk about why I left, what led me in that direction, and made me end up uh, giving out. The story will start once upon a time and end happily ever after. All right, first, what led you to Christianity? I'd have to say my mom was a major influence on my becoming a Christian. She was a Christian, Pentecostal growing up. I know she went to snake handling churches and stuff, like like real redneck stuff, like on the next level, like test your faith, because there's a scripture in Mark that says that you'll be able to handle serpents, and they take that literally, and they literally play with rattlesnakes in church. So she came from that kind of background, Pentecostal, whereas my dad, Roman Catholic, go in, confess your sins, you know, say a few Hail Marys, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, take the toast, and you know, consume of the transubstantiation, if you will, the Lord's Supper communion. And uh, he was a traditional Catholic, but he didn't go much. He was more of an alcoholic in my life. So being introduced to Christianity came from my mom. And I went to a private school called Cornerstone Christian Academy. That's where I really asked the Lord into my life, you know, for my personal Lord and Savior, Jesus. And and uh, I accepted him into my heart because I felt guilty. They gave a lesson on lies, and and from there, uh, I felt bad, you know, because I told quite a few of lies, but Jesus would be able to redeem me from those sins, and I wouldn't have to dwell on them anymore. In fact, his crucifixion and dying on the cross for our sins took all those sins away. So that's what, that's pretty much where it all started. Can you take me through the experience of being a Christian? Yeah, this is going to take a little longer, obviously, to explain, because there's so much I could cover in my experience through Christianity. And I'll try and make it brief as much as possible, because this could take a very long time. Number one, I'm a young kid. I had had experiences and knew the name of Jesus and knew a little bit about the stories, but I didn't latch on. They didn't become like an obsession until I got a little older. I remember asking him into my heart and I felt warm, like a warm sensation, a physical experience, if you will, an emotional gratitude or satisfaction that came from this type of belief, faith, if you will, in Jesus Christ. And so I had become a Christian and I bumped into a guy who introduced me to this church, a home church. Later on realized how much of a cult type church this was, but they spoke in tongues, gibberish, not like trying to speak in another language. They prophesied. They did the whole laying on of hands and healing type stuff and all of that. And so I was like, that was the kind of Christianity that I had known early on was this fringe type extreme, charismatic, non-denominational type Christianity. And um, I remember like my Christian life never 100% matched reality for me. Like it just living this perfect life according to God's word and all this kind of stuff. And then when reality set, it was very difficult to make those line up for me. I, I wasn't able to make the biblical world and who I am as a real human completely, uh, perfectly match. It was always a struggle. And Christians would describe that the battling of the flesh, you know, you're fighting spirit against flesh, the spirit of God, you're warring against the flesh, which yourself die to self daily, this constant battle. It just didn't make sense to me though, because I could never figure out why I kept stumbling, why I would have pornography issues, why I would run into issues with drugs and alcohol or girls and things like that. Like, I always had these things, and then I'd go off in these tangents, living this lifestyle contrary to what Christians say you're supposed to live, and then I'd end up hitting a wall, struggling, either addiction or something else, whether it was me habitually smoking pot like I used to do in high school, failing at school, I wasn't doing good in class in my uh, senior year, so I had to pull myself out. I had a kid on the way, it was actually your sister, and you know, life, life was coming at me. 
so I pulled myself out of 12th grade and I remember giving myself back to the Lord. Uh, dude, I can't tell you how many times I've been saved. Like, I've been saved so many times. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like, no, this time it was the real time, you know, and I meant it. I really did. And I know that Christians out there will say, the Calvinist ones, which is what I ended up later on becoming, will say, well, you were never a sheep to begin with. You were never really an elect chosen. God never really had you chosen from the beginning. This is why you didn't continue, because they have what's called perseverance of the saints. The five, tulip, total depravity, um, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, perseverance of the saints, tulip. And they'll say, well, you didn't persevere, therefore, you were never really one of us. You were never really a chosen son of God. And you may be a reprobate which is why you continue to fall into these traps of doing the thing contrary to God. Anyway, not going there necessarily. I gave my life back to Jesus, back to God. And this is the Bible I actually owned in high school. Um, I remember in class, I was obsessed. And I don't know if you guys can see some of the like highlights and stuff, but I was obsessed. I was obsessed with the story. And when I read that book in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and i began into this journey it was like that movie the kid with the dog the never-ending story and he was reading the book and when he opened the book and the storm's going he was riding on the dog's back flying and then he ends up to this place it was like a journey i went through this journey as i read this book it kept me off drugs for a while i was obsessed with it I remember when I read it, the visuals, you know, of the Noah's flood taking place, I was there. When Moses went on the mountain of God to get the tablets of the stones that he wrote his laws on, I was there. When the children of Israel left Egypt from bondage, I was there. And these stories came to life. They had an experience behind them. They gave me visuals. And so I started digging deeper. And I remember I read the whole book, this whole King James Version only, which that cultic church taught me King James only. And um, I read the whole thing from Genesis to Revelation. And I knew there was a disconnect when I got to the New Testament. That something narrative-wise didn't connect. In fact, there was some genealogical stuff in the Old Testament that I wasn't a big fan of either. But I just didn't like the story as good as the story was in the Old Testament. People had to unpack the New Testament to make it sound like a good story. They were just better well-written, in my opinion, in the, in the Old Testament. So I ended up getting clean off drugs. I got my life together, was reading the Bible, and then, damn it, if you wouldn't know it, I, I, I relapsed. Struggled again. I couldn't understand why, if I had God's Holy Spirit, if I was praying and I was going to church, why would a temptation cross my path that wasn't for just a moment, that once I put the substance in my body, I could not stop using the drug or alcohol and abusing it to numb the way I felt. I mean, I told you I grew up with an alcoholic father. So there was some disconnect there growing up. I had some issues with forgiveness and forgiving my father. How can someone say they're sorry? And then the next night or that very night, drink again, turn into a werewolf, abuse his family verbally, and then turn around the next morning with tears in his eyes, meaning it, saying, I mean it, I'm sorry. I didn't even mean to do this. I didn't mean to. Like how can you, and you gotta imagine psychologically what that'll do to someone. Christianity was a great psychological comfort. It gave me what I needed in times of need. That's pretty much what it boils down to is an experience. So I needed more than just experience because I got challenged along the way by people who did not believe in this book. Man, don't talk about my book. Don't talk about my Bible. And I wanted to defend it because there were words in here that says, study and meditate my word on my word day and night. Show yourself approved, the New Testament says. Prove that you're worthy and defend the faith. And you know? I, I've actually seen you study day and night. Right. So I got really serious about wanting to know the truth. And the way I looked at it as a Christian was truly honest. Like, God is real. He is the way, the truth, the life, right? No one can get to the Father except through Him. And that if this is true, there's no way it can be wrong. Because it's true. Therefore, it doesn't matter what you bring, this will win. If it's true, and yeah. I believe that. Now, every time you have uh, you battled an addiction, yeah, you got clean. You went to faith, right? Always went back to faith. Always went back to faith. We're not and we're not there yet. Ne but now, you got clean. 
Mm-hmm. This is the longest you've been clean. Yeah. Five years, October the 25th, without faith, without Jesus. Yeah. And I think that there's a reason for that, too. I think that there was addiction to this as well. That uh, there was more, it was more of a, it gave me a high. Um, doing that. And I still get these, right? I study, I, we seek our hobbies and things like that. But um, for me, psychologically, it was working against me because I had read too much. I knew a little too much. Once you know too much about it, you've opened up Pandora's box. You've opened up some problems because then you start to look into it and go, okay, well, you guys keep saying God loves everybody, but the book doesn't say that. Jacob, I loved Esau. I hated Psalms 5 verse 5. He abhors, he hates workers of iniquity. Well, I was doing iniquity. I was living a lifestyle of iniquity. Does God really love me? Or does God hate me? You have to really ask these questions because unless you can live that lifestyle, obedient to his law, according to the Old Testament, he abhors workers of iniquity. He hates those who do evil. Was I doing evil? Yeah, according to the law, according to the things that were written in this book. And therefore, did God hate me? So I asked these questions and I was honest. I was truly sincere. And I think anyone who's going to be authentic and truly sincere are going to run into situations that eventually they're going to either be dishonest with themselves for a period of time or remain dishonest with themselves because of the fear that comes with letting go of something sacred, something that you believe is deeper than anything in this world. More important than my children, than my wife, than anything that was real that I could manifest in this actual reality was God, Jesus, this Bible, this was more important than everything to me, ultimately. It was the reason I did love my wife. It was the reason that I did love my kids. It was, you know, the backdrop to anything that was good in my life. It was all God, and therefore, that was how I thought. So there's an extreme depth to this that I won't even be able to cover in this and to be able to explain in depth. But uh, what did you, uh, oh, when you opened Pandora's box for yourself, what did you discover? I found out there was a world of interpretation about this book that ultimately now, today I look and I go, wow, even the most brilliant minds cannot agree. Even the most brilliant men who are coming at this that know the languages and the original sources we have, the original Greek sources, the original Hebrew sources that we have, the oldest sources we have, the evidence that we have, guys who have no ax to grind necessarily are looking at this and they're looking at another man who has no axe to grind and they go, I disagree with you on that one. Sorry, this is what this means. No, 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 this is what it means and you guys are wrong because you're deducting this. When you get into the depth of this book, you'll find out everyone has their own opinions. Nobody really knows the totality of everything that's written here. I mean, we're talking just in the canon, the Protestant version that I'm holding my hand has 66 books. And out of the 66 books, Christians say, 66 authors. They're really wrong about that. There were far more authors. Even like Isaiah was written by at least two to four different authors. Just the one book by written by the author Isaiah. Had multiple authors that had patched in different ideas. The New Testament writings may not have been written by one author in these books. They could have been patchworked by multiple authors. Just one book itself. So there's a complexity to it when you start to remove the veil. Now, if you're getting everything filtered through a pastor like I did for many years, it works. But I remember Ravi Zacharias, and he was one of my favorite apologists because he had an emotion to the intelligence he wanted to bring to the table of Christianity. He says, I connect the mind and the heart. We're bringing Christianity where it connects the mind and the heart. When you really dig, those two do not matter. They don't really, uh, if you mean mind as an intelligence and real history, you're not going to get it. It doesn't connect. There are so many assumptions in apologetics to Christianity that uh, when you really look at actual history to try and dig, you have to make a lot of assumptions, and there's a lot more faith on that end than the critical stance. So anyway, I might be speaking gibberish to you, but um, I, I have to say Pandora's box for me was when I approached a pastor one day. He was giving a lesson at church. I was going to a Calvary Chapel church. I had left the cult church because I'd believed at this point speaking in tongues was not all that crap and they laid on hands and like oh, and you convulse and lay on the ground which i've had a few times where i purposely did it for psychological reasons and other people watch where i laid on the ground as if i was slain in the spirit but really 
it, it was more just a hypnosis type and more like a I wanted to go with the flow of what everyone else was doing in the church. Yeah. It wasn't real. Like, you didn't really knock me on my ass, you know. Yeah. This was part of the the hypnotic effect of the church. And when I realized that speaking in tongues was not a gibberish, rather it was another language according to the book of Acts. They spoke a language that they understood. The miracle was that they either understood the language, either they could hear their own the gospel in their own language, or that the people had the gift of being able to speak in another language, Spanish, German, Italian, whatever that language might have been, to the people. And so it was not blah, 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 blah. it was actual language. And when I saw that, I said, dude, this is cultic. So I started investigating it from other Christians. And at this time, all my investigations were from other Christians about Christians. I never went outside of Christianity at first. I mean, who would? That's scary territory. You don't go to the enemy. You go to someone who sounds like he's on your side to say, listen, our brothers over there are mistaken. Now I'm going to learn. And I approached a pastor who mistakenly misquoted somewhere in John where he says, I will tear down this temple and rebuild it in three days. And they responded and said, it took us 46 years to build this temple, right? Somewhere in the Gospel of John. Well, he said 40 years. And I knew, I was like, pastor was going off the top of his mind and he missed what it actually says. So I said, he misquoted the Bible. That's how like I started getting so deep. I'm realizing mistakes the pastor's making by quoting the book. And I said, it's 46 years, not 40. He said 40. So then I approached him after not to correct or anything. I was very polite, but I said, uh, do you know how I can learn more? I want to know more. And he says, you should check out going to Carolina Bible College. It's right down the street. And maybe talk about becoming a pastor. I thought about that. I was always interested in that. I said, maybe I'll be a pastor. Maybe I'll lead a flock and have my own church and teach because I felt that passion. So I went to college. And that's a whole other, you know, story. So what's the reason why you left Christianity or discuss, you know, your exodus? Okay, so yeah, the exodus. Of, let, me, let me back up to leading up to my exodus from Christianity because... I had already tasted a few flavors of the rainbow, so to speak, when it comes to a varieties of different Christianities, Protestant versions of Christianities. They were not liberal. They were very conservative. And I was interested in finding out more. So I went to Carolina Bible College. I was an Arminian, so to speak. I didn't know what the hell that was at the time. Practically, I believed God knew the future. He planned everything, but he gave us all free will. So this goes into philosophy, and there's a huge debate within Christianity on what's called Calvinism and Arminianism and Pelagianism and these different groups. Open theism, absolute hard determinism. I'm throwing out lingo here that's used a lot, and they debate. Does God really know the future? Or does God not only know the future, but absolutely determines everything that ever happens in human history or ever? God's in absolute control. Calvinism on steroids or Pelagian open theism where God actually doesn't even know the future. He kind of wings it as he goes. He kind of adjusts things as he goes, so to speak. And there's two spectrums within Christianity like this. Of course, I was going with what I saw. What appeared to me in the Bible from all these passages was that God, God knew what was going to happen and planned it. In fact, he... He would tell, like, according to the narrative, he would tell uh, Abraham, you know, I'm going to take your kids and bring them into the land of Egypt and make them slaves. But don't worry, I'm going to make them free 400, you know, 430 years later. And, of course, he predicted and planned and purposed their slavery in Egypt just so that he could, by his own power, save them. So it's like he led them in Egypt were a place where they end up becoming slaves, and then he saves them from Egypt. So he was able to show his kindness and mercy, and also show judgment. And so this is the way, philosophically, the only way God could show good and evil, and this goes into a whole other spectrum. So I went to a guy who was teaching at the college, and he was a Calvinist. He was a pastor. And his name was Andy Webb. Very nice guy. To this day, he's a great guy. But uh, he taught me Calvinism, and he also taught a few classes, where I became a great student. And I took this guy real serious. I said, where's your church at? Let me come check it out. So while I was getting my bachelor's degree in biblical studies and theology, I went to this church. And uh, this church was Providence PCA. 
It was a PCA Presbyterian church where there were Calvinists. And I kept studying and went to college. And as I was doing that, I was realizing even in this, how many different types of Christianity there really are, even within Calvinist, Baptist Calvinist, Reformed Presbyterian type Calvinist with infant baptism. And then there's, uh, are you supposed to infant baptize or only baptize as believing professing Christians? Like they debate over this stuff. And sometimes people draw lines in the sand. And if you don't, if you don't believe like them, you're not thinking biblical. So I started going to this Providence PCA church. And I was investigating a theory of eschatology that I've never heard of. You might be going, what the heck? What? You're throwing a lot of junk, like all these words around. And I don't know what half of them may mean. That's okay, because I didn't either. And the college that I went to would teach me what a lot of these terms mean. And eschatology is the study of last things. You've got things like angelology or demonology or uh, soteriology, salvation, soter. Um, a lot of these are technical terms to try and define theological things. All this stuff is theology. It's all Bible theology type stuff that I'm into. And I looked into eschatology. And I always, as a Christian, believed Jesus was going to come back. The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ was going to return. And not only that, the final judgment, the resurrection from the dead, all these teachings that the church has been saying are going to happen that are in the Bible, that are supposed to happen, are going to happen. And along this path, I remember I relapsed again. Like I kept finding myself screwing up. Uh, whether it was alcohol, whether it was drugs, I kept having a tough time trying to stay a good Christian who wasn't doing the wrong thing, trying to go to church and do what's right. But I'd be ashamed. And so through this struggle, every time I would relapse, I would open up my mind and think of things I wouldn't have usually thought of or I wouldn't have even entertained. It took humbling me because I always thought I was right. I found something I thought was true. I was right, and I pushed it, maximized it, built all my walls and this giant castle out of it. And then later on, come to find out after I tore it down from my humbleness, getting my ass beat by addiction or something, that I was like, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I'm not believing in something that's true because my belief in these things aren't giving me the power to really be able to stay clean. I couldn't do it. I kept trying. I couldn't stay clean. I went to church, and we had communion, and this church was real wine. And even that little bit of wine, when I sipped it, I felt the warm wine go down my esophagus, and I felt a warm, fuzzy, tingly sensation. I said, well, Jesus drank wine. Why can't I? So I took, brought wine home and started drinking wine. Wine turned into malt liquor. Malt liquor turned into liquor. And there you are. Here I am drinking again. And I'm an alcoholic, like openly, like scientific. You know what I'm saying? Not like, oh, you're a bad morale. Your person... You're a bad person. That's why you did these things. And I realize there's some science to a lot of all the things I'm talking about here. I started studying eschatology. I started listening to what's called partial preterism and amillennialism. I read a book called A Case for Amillennialism when I was a pre-mill dispensationalist. All this mumbo jumbo. And then you're like, what the freak is all this stuff? Well, amillennialism, I was convinced of it. Just by reading one book. It was enough evidence for me to see that there's something more going on. And then I started looking into partial preterism, post-millennialism. And there was R.C. Sproul, Gary DeMar, and Kenneth Gentry. These guys said, look, guys, you're missing it. All that stuff that you guys are waiting to happen was fulfilled in 70 AD in the first century with the temple's destruction. And as I heard these guys over many lectures that I thought it rang so true in my ears, they kept mentioning this thing called 70 AD doctrine. And they said, heretical, full preterism. It's a heresy. It's a biblical. These guys are totally off their rockers. And they're wrong. Period. Which made me kind of want to know, what do they teach? Because I want to know what they teach. Just so I can at least say, yeah, they're wrong with you. And I, I didn't dig into it yet. Years later, when I did not even realize, I'm on YouTube after another relapse. I saw this man named Don Preston. And in this video, he said, Jesus Christ did come back in the first century. The second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ already happened in the past. And when I heard him say that, I said, what kind of drugs is this mother on? Like, 
Who believes Jesus came back already? This is such a fringe conspiracy theory. I, I gotta click the next video. And I clicked it. And as I clicked that, I wanted to click the next one. And I started to watch this guy like, holy crap. I opened my Bible, I started looking and going, whoa, that makes sense in English, in my English translation that I have, it made sense. Like, dude, he, he, di he did come back. How could I miss it? He said he would. Either he did or he didn't. And if he didn't, he lied. And how could God in the flesh, being a Trinitarian, someone who believes that God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God, three bodies and three persons in one God, how could I say that God would lie? He said he was coming. Am I going to deny that? Or am I going to accept it? And then I accepted it. I became a full preterist, which set me up in a weird way when the church found out that I was actually believing this and talking to other members of the church. Like they were telling me, you need to stop. They even had a council. They sat five men in front of me, five elders, trying to talk to me and tell me, you need to stop. It's heresy. You need to drop it and try to convince me to stop with, with full preterism because it was against the church doctrines. And, um, but they were kind, but I felt I was on the heat. I was on the hot seat and I felt very judged at that moment. I mean, I, they were practically all sitting there. And from that day, I felt very uncomfortable coming back to the church because I couldn't, they couldn't convince me from the scripture, from the Bible. And I was like, dude, he, it says very clearly that it had to. So either you accept it did or it didn't. And I became a full preterist and over time, a religious full preterist went to a church in Michael Miano's church in Blue Point Bible Church, Blue Blue Letter Bible, I can't remember what it's called, in uh, Long Island, New York. I went and gave my uh, testimony and I taught a lesson on this and how the first, cent first century was the end and how it did happen. And then I relapsed. <laughs> and this happened a lot, you know. I, I, you know, gave my life to the Lord a lot. And I remember watching uh, Zeitgeist, this movie, which now knowing there's a lot of mistakes that I believe are taking place in this. There's a lot of errors in how they connect like Horus and things like that. But it did something psychologically that I needed because along this whole path that I've explained to you, I was in apologetics. I wanted to rationalize my faith. I wanted to give solid, concrete evidence to defend Christianity. The more people came on and were acting like it's not true, the more I wanted to prove it real true because it's the truth, right? I wanted to prove it. And the more I went to go prove it from the Christian side, I learned more from their angle. I thought I had more evidence. And then one day came when I saw this video site, guys, psychologically, it compares Jesus to all these other divine beings, all these other gods, makes him look identical to them, even though he wasn't. And it's not a factual document. There's not, every, not everything in there is factual. But it compared him to the sun. It said he's all like all these other gods. And that's when I started to look into that. I started to open up to the side that I never was on, the dark side. Don't ever look there. Once you do, and you really take into consideration if you're like me, and you really want to figure out what the truth is saying, once you go there, you won't want to come back. You won't want to stop looking into it and investigating what's going on. So I started, and when I started looking into Jesus, I started running into faces that I saw debating Christians that I once was like, yes, beat him, the Christian one. The guy that he was debating is the guy I'm now listening to just to see what he has to say honestly. Not watching the debate, hoping the Christian bashes him just so the Christian could win so that my book is safe and my faith is protected. No, I, I actually started listening to the side and started going, what are you saying? I want to honestly think, could you be right? I really was honestly willing to say, could you be right? And as I listened to them, I started considering maybe they are. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe all this time I've been wrong. But I didn't accept it. It was too emotional for me to let go of. I couldn't just let go of Jesus. I couldn't just let go of the, of the Bible and God. So I started seeing a bigger picture. I saw patterns. I looked at scholars and said, you know the story of Noah and the flood actually came from an older story of the Epic of Gilgamesh. Like, this is borrowed from a different story. And I said, well, how can that be? You know, Christians used to debate and argue and say, no, this is the oldest version. Everyone else copied it. Or they're all similar stories of the same event. And they always had an explanation. But when I listened to real scholars, 
real serious, non-axe grinding, not having a bias. I got something I have to protect in order to just coming at this thing raw and, and uncensored, so to speak. Came out on the other side saying, yeah, this, this we have archaeological evidence. We have evidence that this is older than the narrative in the, in the biblical account. And at that point, I started to go, oh, wow. Okay, this book, is this really infallible, inerrant? I came from a fundamentalist background. Like, is this the perfect book? This is the one true book. If anything, they had to copy from this. But now I'm finding out this book and its authors might be copied from other books and other stories. Started to broaden my perspective and realize, okay, at this point, I still believe in God. I still believe in Jesus. Maybe there's a bigger picture. Maybe maybe God is, is like the God of all people. And like he tells his own in different ways, has a story told in all the cultures Kind of like the poem, The Six Wise Men of Hindustan. If you haven't read it, check it out. It's actually interesting. It's about an elephant. And all these men who are blind come and touch the elephant. One touches the tusk. One touches the tail. One touches the ear. Oh, God, this elephant's like a fan. Oh, the elephant's like a rope. No, elephant's like a saw. No, elephant's like this. And they're all disputing far and wide and all this. And at the end, all what they mean and what they think. On an elephant, they haven't even seen. And that's what I found out. Like, maybe God's the elephant, right? But then I took in further the reality that maybe there's more human and natural explanations that I never, ever even thought that were right in front of my eyes. Like, like me. Like, I actually saw me for once. And I went, you're, you're a real dude, you know? Like, I've been lost in this world of, like, fantasy metaphysics and all this, like, deep lost philosophy and at this point in my life i'm gonna die i mean i'm mainlining heroin in my veins i'm dying and god is not saving me the last time i used heroin i ended up at this lady's house and it was some strange stuff that did happen to me but when you're in traumatic situations the world can line up if you really want it to and i said some prayers this is the last time i really really called out to god five years ago just about and I was crying out. I said, I can't do it. I need your help. I can't do it by myself. And it took me a year or two to look back to that moment, the beginning of my getting off heroin, to realize that that was me talking to me the whole time. And I was telling myself, you better get your shit together, man. You have to make it or you're going to die. Survival of the fittest. And I did. And I latched on to anything that could potentially help me. And I cried out for help and I surrendered and I used all the principles of Christianity, so to speak, you know, surrender and, 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 and be honest and tell the truth and really mean what I say and say what I mean, but really do it. And, uh, I haven't used drugs since, but every time I was religious, it was like superficial. Like I said, at the beginning of this, I couldn't line up reality like me with what I was believing. And that's where we come in today in my exodus. I got excommunicated from the church for absence, not going to church, even though full preterism played a huge part of me not wanting to go. I mean, would you like to constantly appear so that people can look at you sideways and go, yeah, he believes in some weird crap? Like, you're supposed to have similar beliefs as the people you go to church to. You're supposed to have some stuff in common. And my wife and I were excommunicated. So I actually took it and I said, well, I still love the book. This book mystifies me now more than ever. I actually love this book more now than I think I ever have in a different way because I see the human. I see the guys who wrote this for what they really were, humans, writing something during a time in which they were probably in a crisis too. And from what they understood, the God of the gaps idea pops in. They don't understand what's happening to their people. So they're calling out, God, why are you doing this? And they don't realize maybe there's some other natural explanations. Why are these earthquakes and hurricanes and all these natural disasters occurring? God, it must be. I can, I can only imagine if we were in the ancient world, we'd think the same thing. But now we have plate tectonics and understanding how certain temperatures and sciences cause certain things to happen in the natural world, unlike the ancients. I know I'm rabbit trailing all over so the place. So basically their God is what you don't understand. I mean, practically, yeah. Like anything that we can't explain is usually we make up God story. comes in. We into... make up our opinion of it. Right. 
pretty much what we think is God fills in that gap, this God of the gaps argument. Like, we still don't know scientifically how to explain ultimately the origins of the universe. We have, there's certain, you just mathematically, we can't go back to anything prior to uh, the decimal point that they would say where our universe is expanding and it contracted at some point. I'm no scientist. I'm, don't, I, I'm not acting like I know. I've listened to the debates from the Christians and I've heard the atheists and the scientists come back and forth, but like something had to always exist. So Christians and, and those who are theists will say, well, God created everything and God always existed. And then people go, but then where did God come from? Did who created God, right? I used to think that was the dumbest questions that atheists could ever ask. Because it was right in front of my eyes. Dude, you didn't hear me? Nothing, because God is eternal. God always was. Nothing created God. But that's a cop-out, too. That's acting as if you know that God is eternal and that he's everlasting. Why couldn't the universe have always existed? Maybe it's too, too complex for me to even explain or our brains to even wrap our heads around on really trying to understand this. You know? <laughs> There's a theory that, that we're in a matrix for real. I mean, there's different ideas, but that we're plugged in somewhere and that this is all virtual reality, that we're practically living a video game, so to speak. So What's I'm just throwing it on. I don't buy it, personally. I'm not gonna say it's not possible. I'm just saying I don't buy it. To me, the natural world seems so, um, I, you know, I used, to, I used to think, like I used to have this like self-aware thoughts, if you will, if this makes sense that uh, it's not my time to die. Like, I won't be dying anytime soon. There's nothing that's going to make me die right now or anytime soon. It just is going to come. That I was chosen by God and that at some point down the road, when he's done using me for his mission, I'll die. Right now? No. And that, that psychological, if you will, view on me, uh, it is carried on even into this time. Now I have to catch myself and go, bro, you can die real real easily if you keep playing with thunder. You know what I'm saying? Lightning, fire, whatever. It's going to get you. So along this whole path, and I wanted to know more, if you will, I started discovering different theories about the Bible that were not the ones the church taught. A kind of a conspiratorial angle, if you will. I mean, I did have a kind of conspiracy. I mean, if... If full preterists are right, as I was toward the end, that the whole church missed Jesus' second coming, the resurrection of the dead, because they misunderstood understood the terms, the way that full preterists define these terms, um, how can I trust the church, which has taught these doctrines for 2,000 years, if they didn't get that right? So at that point, I was not orthodox. I had an unorthodox position. You could call me a heretic. And if the church is wrong about that, what else are they wrong about? When I looked at all these other people who did not believe in the Bible and started looking at the theories, I came across different ideas. Uh, Joseph Atwell with his Caesar's Messiah book and looked at the Roman provenance angle with uh, James Stevens Valiant and Warren Fi creating Christ. That's the Roman provenance angle that I looked at. I started looking at astrotheology. I looked at Acharya S. I was checking out videos on the astrotheology and there was a couple other names that are out there that talk on this topic. And as I started looking at that, I saw pieces of this. And at first, I believed all of it. Like, I was like, whoa, hook, line, and sinker convinced 100% of these theories. And as I delved deeper, I began to be more critical, even on the critical thinkers. So now I'm being critical of the critical thinkers that are bringing different ideas out. Because if I'm going to be consistent and I'm going to be true, I'm not going to believe in something because it sounds true. That's what I did as Christian. As a Christian, I saw it, it seemed true because I could see it in God's word. I started with these ideas, therefore it was true. Now I poke holes in the hole pokers. <laughs> if that sounds right. The guys who poke holes, I'm poking holes in the guys who poke holes. I want to really test them to see if what they're saying is true. I started a program, Myth Vision Podcast, on YouTube. Literally just kind of a journaling type show of my quest trying to find out fringe ideas and other non-fringe ideas, mainstream ideas and scholarship about whether even Jesus Christ existed at all. Now think about this. Two billion people on the planet practically go by the religion of Christianity. Two billion people on the planet that are Christians believe that Jesus Christ in the Bible existed in history. 
What would that mean if he did not exist? I mean, like, think about this for a second on the, the, how serious this is. Two billion people believe in him as some type of faith. And to find out he may not even have existed at all, it's an interesting question. Whether it's true or not, I'm agnostic on whether or not Jesus actually existed or not. Even though I lean, depending on the day and the evidence and whatever's being said, I lean that there could have been a guy at the basis. But it's extremely mythologized and there's a lot of fiction in there. So it's hard for me to say with, with the evidence I've seen and the arguments that have been made on whether or not this guy actually existed or not. So that's been a question on my channel. Did he exist? Then other questions come up. Like the whole borrowing concept from Noah's Flood or Adam and Eve. All these stories are borrowed. There's borrowing from Greeks. There's borrowing from other ancient Near Eastern mythologies. Beautiful stories. I love them. I really do. But they're borrowing. What about the New Testament? Is that borrowing? I found a lot of liberal Christians believe that a lot of the stories in the Old Testament are myth. Even Jonah getting swallowed by a giant fish or a whale, whoever wants to accept either one, for three days and three nights, and then he comes up and he goes and preaches to Nineveh. A lot of liberal Christians say, yeah, 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 that's, that's allegory. It's mythology. We don't buy that literally. But then when you come to Jesus Christ, a man who's supposedly walking through ancient Palestine or in Israel, and he's supposedly healing the blind and the deaf and the dumb and everyone of all these illnesses, he himself gets crucified, buried in a in a rich man's tomb, rises from the dead three days and three nights later, which not literally, if you actually see the account, it's not literally three days and three nights, but supposedly three days later on Sunday, he rises from the dead. That's literal, though. We, we, there are certain areas we're not willing to go, Derek. And I'm going, hmm, that's weird. So then you got to wrestle with these ideas. Like, did he really rise from the dead? Did any other gods that weren't Jesus actually do the miracles that they say? I mean, Vespasian, who was the emperor at the end of the first century during the Jewish-Roman War, around 70-70-something CE or AD, it says that he healed a blind man with spit. And I don't know if it was mud, but definitely spittle. Spittle is what they call it. He healed a blind man with spit. Jesus healed a blind man with spit. Who's lying? Did they both heal blind man with spit? Did Jesus actually do it, but Vespasian didn't? Did Vespasian do it, and Jesus didn't? So now you gotta pick. You gotta pick which one's true, which one's wrong. Or are they all saying something that we're not sure what they're trying to say? Or are they adding value to the narrative, value to the character to mythologize and make them greater than what they might have been as a common practice of mythologizing people in ancient history? Your guess is as good as mine, but I'm on a journey trying to figure it out. Because I believed he definitely died and rose again. I used to say, if the Bible said Jonah swallowed a well, I'd believe it. <laughs> if Jonah swallowed a well. So, yeah, that's kind of my exodus out, is I really took to the next level. I always tell people, reading the Bible and truly studying the Bible led me out of the Bible. Where are you at today with all of it? So I believe that this is where I'm at today. I love researching the book. A lot of people who leave Christianity want nothing to do with it at this point. They're done. They're like, okay, I found out that the book is not true in that sense, that its mysteries are solved. It's a man-made book, and I don't buy it. I found issues with this book. I don't believe it. Therefore, I'm done. I wash my hands of it. I'm not like that. I actually find it interesting. I'm intrigued with it because as much as this is mythology, it's also history for me. And it is actual history, even if it's mythologized history. I find beauty in the book. I really do. Uh, there might be some stuff that isn't true in the literal sense, but neither is, let's just take, for example, Jack and the Beanstalk, but the story is really interesting. You know, you start reading these other other fictional types of counts, legends, you know, uh, Paul Bunyan and the Blue Ox and things like this. And you go, well, there are people, places, and things that are here that are literal history. And then the story itself is fiction, taking place in possibly a real geographic, you know, geographic location. It might be a literal place, literal people, 
but it's fictional. When something has you as clawed as deep as this did, and it's almost like, uh, let me use a negative example. Imagine if someone was sexually abused by someone, right? They can't help but obsess over the person that, that raped them or did something, molested them, whatever it might be. They can't help but obsess over them for what they did to them. In a sense, there was nothing like that, but this book and my perception of it and what I was taught, it had its claws so deep. My relationship with it was like a marriage. And to find out she was cheating on me the whole time and I didn't even know it. I want to know everything I can about this, especially when it claws 2 billion people on the planet. And it doesn't just affect the 2 billion Christians on the planet. This book has caused a trickle effect. Out of Judaism from the Old Testament caused Christianity and fringe sects like Gnosticism and other views. And out of the New Testament and the Old Testament, you had Islam or the Muslim faith that came and that came later but all affected from the monotheistic views that are found in the Old Testament Bible and some heretical books that are probably found from the New Testament or uh, pseudepigraphical writings that are utilized in the Islamic faith, all coming from a monotheistic type of view. But this book has touched so many people on the planet and it just blows me away how many people every day have no clue what they're reading or you know, they're not really taking a critical stance and I get it, I don't, I don't blame them. I understand it and I don't hate Christians. In fact, I'm very patient with them because I understand what they're like. A lot of atheists turn out to be douchebags and assholes and it's not me. It's not me, I love them because I understand where they're at. In fact, faith to me is blind and their, their faith, they have faith. It's blind. They believe in things that there may not be real good reason to believe. In real history, there's no actual good reasons to believe these things literally However, it's emotion. It's an emotional gratification. So I know that I was a Christian, not because I knew with absolute certainty or scientific evidence or anything like that, that something was true. I did it because I felt like it was true. It felt right. And what he said meant something that was good to me. It's all emotion. What is the Vision Podcast? Ultimately, is a journey, like I said, Myth Vision Podcast is my own journey, but it is a place where heresy is committed. It is where you're allowed to touch the untouchable, where we're able to talk about things that I would never have been allowed to talk about. It is my sacred ground. It's where I tell you to take your sandals off because you're getting on holy ground here. To me, Myth Vision is a place where um, all ideas are welcomed and tested and it's my journey on exploring what really is going on and when I say with this book that's a broad question because really sometimes it's down to the chapter or paragraph even down to like the sentence in this book Acts 17 when Paul says your poets say and he's quoting a pagan poet to an audience in the Areopagus in, in the Areopagus in Athens and Rome. Why is he quoting a pagan poet? There's, there's complexity to this. There's a lot here. And arguments are made theologically, philosophically. You name it. This book has caused havoc. People have killed so many people because of this book. And this, people, this book here has helped many people get out of tough times. So uh, it's a mystery. But Myth Vision Podcast to me is not only exploring this book, which has been the primary focus so far, early on in this, this show, uh, but it will be exploring the other sacred books that have influenced countless other people from other cultures. That's the goal of Myth Vision. That's what Myth Vision is. Myth Vision is a journey. So, on your journey, what do you find of everything? I'm trying to look at things naturally. I want to take a naturalistic approach. I mean, I thought God created Adam from the dust and then blew a life-giving spirit he breathed into Adam and made this man of dust into a living being. That's how Genesis depicts Adam's creation. From dust and dirt, he breathed life into him, and then boom, he's alive. And so I said, okay, evolution can't be true. Let's just start looking into science and checking biology and looking at fossil records and checking into this and saying, well, did, did we come from something other than what we are right now. 
and investigating that honestly, like I did the biblical one, I started to say, maybe this is the case. I'm still skeptical on certain things. I'm not certain, but I'm pretty convinced with the evidence that I see that we came from previous species. I have no reason to doubt these ideas now, in my opinion. I mean, I know that's not necessarily biblically related, but the Bible also talks about the earth sitting on foundations as if it's flat. And science says the earth's a sphere. Why? Now, I know there's a lot of flat earthers out there that will say, oh, the earth is flat. Scientists are lying. Trust me. Yeah, I know your face is like, what? Yes, there are people who believe the earth is flat. A lot of them biblical minded or Islamic uh, minded because a lot of the Islam folks believe the earth was flat. There's arguments for that. But uh, science is what I started looking into and saying, well, there might be a natural explanation. Then there was epistemology. You start looking into what's called epistemology. And you start checking into... Um, I, I tried to consider what I can see and what I can test as primarily my sources for trying to understand and get at truth. That would be my best guess. And then some of it's going to be absolutely speculative based on probability, all that kind of stuff. Those are fun to me. It's kind of like guessing with good data. And that's why myth vision is so fun because you can come on and go, wow, the Caesars might have been involved in the creation of the New Testament. It seems like it could be possible. And then the next episode doesn't seem like it's possible. Sounds like some other explanation might make sense for why it was created or who wrote this and why and all those interesting theories. Well, that sounds like a lot of people need to check out Myth Vision. Yeah, if you're into this kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you for coming. Yeah, brother.